to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms, praise God, just as I am. Amen. Thank you so much, teenagers, for ministering to us tonight through music. I'm very pleased to see the, not just the talent that our teens have, but the ability to, um, to use that talent to serve the Lord is a tremendous blessing to see. Um, as for one who has not been blessed with musical talent, um, it's exciting to see our teens get involved and serve and use their voices and instruments to praise the Lord. Well, if you'll take your Bibles with me and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 is where we're going to be tonight. Um, A few minutes ago, we sang a song called Living Hope. And that's been a theme that we have been studying in youth group on Wednesday nights. We have been studying 1 Peter. And there's that theme of living hope and that Jesus Christ is our hope. And tonight, I want to share a few verses with you. These are actually a couple of verses that I wasn't able to get to in our study together with our teenagers, but some that, um, that stuck out to me, a few things in there that were really interesting to me. And so I got to study a little bit more and be able to share it with you this evening. We're going to be in 1 Peter this evening, and I want to start reading um, verse 3 is where I want to begin, and then we'll, we'll go on from there. But I don't know if anyone had a chance to open up maybe your Bible app if you had the Version Bible app today and saw the verse of the day. 
Um, just by coincidence, this was the verse of the day on the Bible app, in case you saw that earlier. If you didn't, you get to read it right now. But in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And praise the Lord that we have a living hope in Jesus Christ. Um, there's a lot of things that you and I may hope for. Uh, I know Pastor R.C. was hoping today that the Dolphins would win. Uh, that was a, a long shot, but that's a hope for every sports fan, right? That your team will win. Uh, maybe it's a hope of yours that um, you will get to eat some place that you love to eat. Uh, maybe if you're going out to eat, it's like, oh, I hope they choose this place. I, I hope we go there. Or whatever the hope may be, we, we hope in certain things. But here Peter is reminding us that our hope should never be in a thing or a possession or something like that. But our hope should be in a person, specifically the person of Jesus Christ. And I love the way that it's worded. He's not just a hope. He is a living hope. Not a, not a dead hope. Not someone who's died and that's it. We, we just study about him in the books. But someone who is alive today. And it says, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he is our living hope. And since he is our living hope, that produces so many things in our life. So many positive things. So many positive things. So many great things things that we can receive because he's our living hope. And tonight, I, I want our focus to be on salvation. As you'll see in the verses that we're going to read, the theme is definitely salvation. And, and so I would say that a living hope produces a wonder for salvation, Produ produces a wonder in our life about this amazing concept, this amazing word, salvation. John MacArthur, he says this about salvation. He says, salvation, what a word. Is there any word in the English language as blessed as that one? Is there any word in the English language as hopeful as that one? Is there any word in the English language as comforting as that one? As securing, as assuring? I think not. Salvation, spiritual salvation, the rescue of the human soul from sin and death and hell and Satan. It's the greatest theme of scripture. And tonight, we want to focus on that salvation. So if you look down at verse 9, jump down a few verses, and we're going to read verse 9 down to verse 12 in 1 Peter chapter 1. It says this, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into." Tonight, from these verses that we just read, I want us to see really four aspects of this salvation. Four things that we want to consider uh, about the salvation that we're talking about um, as a Christian. At four things that we should consider. First of all, I want to look at the blessings of salvation. We're going to go through these pretty quick and just um, try to understand the best that we can. But I want to also try to give some application at the end. But there is a lot of truth behind this, a lot of doctrine. But I'm hoping tonight as well that we can receive some application from this. But the first one um, I would say is the blessings of salvation. And, and what I want to emphasize on this is that the blessings of salvation are not just future. Yes, we look forward to being, for, we look forward to heaven. We look forward to the eternal blessings, which there are many. But the blessings of salvation, we don't have to wait until the future. We can enjoy the blessing of salvation even in the present. So I want to back up and go through a few verses from verse 3 down to verse 9 that I think just lists some of these blessings that come with salvation. So if you go back to verse 3, we read that verse a few minutes ago, but look what it says. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, he hath begotten us again unto a living hope. So I would say one blessing of salvation is we've been given a second chance. We've been born again. 
We've been given a chance to, to make things right and to do that right here on this earth. Verse 4 says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. So there's a future blessing, but I also believe that's a, a present blessing because right now in the moment, it gives us something to look forward to. Don't you enjoy having things look forward to in your life? Don't you enjoy looking forward to that vacation? Okay, are you looking forward to uh, maybe this event going on? Looking forward to this game happening? Right, we look forward to things. And so there it says that we have something reserved. It's guaranteed. It's our inheritance that's been put away for us. Then in verse number six, it says this. It says, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Another blessing of salvation is that it gives us joy even in the midst of our trials. And there it says that sometimes we might go through trials. It, sometimes it might be necessary. But even in the trial, we can rejoice. And that's another blessing of salvation. And let me give you a couple more found in verse number eight. It says this, Whom having not seen, ye love. And whom, though now you see him not, ye believe. Ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Another blessing of salvation is being able to love God. Even though we've never seen him. We can love him. Even though we've never seen him, we can trust him. We can believe in him. And then he gives us that inexpressible joy. To me, those are just many blessings of salvation, but those are some that are found right here in this passage. And there in verse 9, it says that we have received the end of our faith, even the salvation of your souls. We have obtained the end of our faith. We have obtained the outcome of our salvation. Yes, there's a lot to look forward to in heaven. But even now on earth, we have already begun to obtain the blessings of those salvation. So the first aspect of this is the blessings of salvation. But second of all, I want us to see the messengers of salvation. Now this is pretty interesting, okay? As Peter goes through this, this text with us, he, he changes perspectives and goes, okay, now we're looking at the blessings of salvation, but now he changes perspective and gives the perspective of four different groups or individuals and looks at their perspective toward this same theme of salvation. So let's look at what they are, and, and as I go through these next few verses, I'm going to try to unpack several things, but, but I promise you we're going to bring it all together at the end, all right? So, so first of all, some of the messengers of salvation, and I'll look at it. First of all, the prophets. It says this in verse 10, of which salvation, so that salvation that's talked about in verse 9, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now th this is really interesting. It says that the prophets, they, they prophesied about the coming of Christ. They prophesied about salvation. They prophesied about the sufferings and the glories of Christ that were going to take place. But even them, they did not fully understand it. They had it written out. They had some things revealed to them, but yet they still had so many questions. So what did they do? They searched the scriptures. They were inquiring about it. And those are two very strong words used there, search and inquire. And then it gives us also that word, they did this diligently. They wanted to know. So what do they want to know? It says in verse 11, they search what and what manner of time. So they're wondering, okay, well, well who? Who's this going to be? Who's this Messiah? Who's the one that's going to suffer? Well, when is this going to take place? They had all these questions that they did not have answers to. But we do. And the prophets search diligently for those things. And, I, and I, as I read that, I thought about this. And man, I, I wonder what it's, what it's, what's our type of approach when it comes to the scriptures. I mean, this, the prophets, they were the ones that were writing this stuff down. So they like wrote down what they wrote and then they went back and studied it. Say, okay, what does it all mean? And they went back to the writings of other prophets. What does this all mean? 
And what about us? What's, what's the last thing that you have really researched and diligently inquired about? I, I know for me several times it's whenever I'm going to buy something of value. I, I do my research, right? I, I read all those Amazon reviews and go through them all. Four star, five star, one star. I try to find out who's telling the truth, right? Or, or maybe it's you're searching out, you're doing a, a paper for your class or for a master's class and you're doing all the research on that subject. Or maybe you're researching a recipe or several different ways that you could do this. What's the last thing that you have researched and inquired diligently? Would God's word be on that list? Would the scriptures and the theme of salvation be on that list? Something that you search out diligently and inquire and study? So we see that the first perspective is that of the prophets, and they were inquiring about salvation. But then second of all, we see the Spirit. There in verse 11 and verse 12, it says the Spirit's involvement, and it said that the Spirit did testify beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall follow. And then down in verse 12, when it's talking about the apostles preaching, it says that they preach the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost. And so I would say we see the Spirit's involvement in the inspiration of the scriptures, but also through the empowered, when the, when the disciples and apostles would preach God's word, the Holy Spirit's empowering them to proclaim the truth. And so again, the Spirit is testifying and saying and revealing these things of what's going to take place. And, and to me, this just reminds me that the entire Bible is all about Christ. He's the theme of the Old Testament. He's the theme of the New Testament. And he made sure the writers, the Holy Spirit made sure the writers got that and wrote that down. He made sure the New Testament writers wrote that down. Um, it was Peter himself, the next letter that he writes. He says, no scripture, no prophecy of scripture is any private interpretation. We did not originate this thing. This did not come from man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved, as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we can trust what we're reading about Christ. And then third of all, we can see the perspective of the apostles. The apostles proclaim, there in verse number 12, it says this, and which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. So now he's saying, okay, the prophets talked about in the Old Testament, but now you got the apostles in the New Testament, and they are proclaiming. They are preaching about Jesus Christ. They are now giving you the message. And when Peter's writing this letter, he's writing it to Christians. He's writing to Christians who have been scattered around because of persecution. And so he's trying to give them hope. He's trying to remind them, say, listen, these apostles, these guys that you've heard preach, they're preaching about salvation. They're preaching about Christ to you. And then one more group of people that Peter mentions there of a, of a perspective of salvation, and that is about the angels. Look at the end of verse number 12, and it says this, which things the angels desire to look into. So we see that the angels, they pondered salvation. It says they longed to look into salvation. They desired salvation. It literally means they would like stretch for their head, longing to see something. And again, I thought that was fascinating. I teach a few Bible classes to students, to high school students. And whenever we get on the subject of angels, they always have questions. All these questions about angels, it fascinates us, does it not? Like the, the spiritual world and, and, and angels or fallen angels, we have so many questions. We're fascinated by angels, but do you know what fascinates the angels? It's salvation. Sometimes when I talk about salvation to my class, we just kind of, yeah, I've heard this before. I'm not really that interested. But angels, oh man, I'm curious. I want to know more about angels. Well, what do angels want to know more about? They want to know more about salvation. Why? Because they're not a recipient of salvation. They had a part in salvation. They, they would be considered a messenger. They announced the good news that Christ was born, right? They, they foretold that to Mary. They announced the good news to the shepherds. They announced to the, to the women at the tomb that he's not here. He's alive. 
They announced to disciples that Jesus will come back one day, right? They were messengers, but they're not recipients of salvation. So to them to look on salvation and say, wow, how could God do this? Look at God and how God sent his son to die for sinners, and he saved them. He redeemed them. He has bought them back. The angels desire to look into the theme of salvation. So I thought those were four interesting perspectives. And again, we'll kind of come back to that perspective about these four individuals in just a moment. But I want you to see, before we go that, um, come back to that, I want you to see the motive that I believe is listed here about salvation. So we see the, the blessing, we see the messenger. Well, I want you to see also the motive. In fact, if you look in verse 10, this is at the very end of verse 10. It says, The prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. What made salvation so fascinating? What made salvation so interesting to the prophets, to the apostles, where they could not stop talking about it? to the angels who can't stop looking at it. What makes salvation so fascinating? I think it's the motive behind that salvation, and that is its grace. It says they prophesy the grace that should come unto you. Now, what Peter is not saying, he is not saying that the Old Testament didn't have any grace. Okay, the, the Old Testament is filled with grace. There's individuals, there's stories, there's verses. I mean, the Old Testament is filled with grace. We, we know that. We see like, people like Noah who found grace right, in the eyes of the Lord. But the Old Testament has not seen grace like we've seen on the cross. The grace that was coming on the cross was even better than the grace that they see in the Old Testament. And that motive was so fascinating. That salvation is completely grace-driven. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. We could do nothing to obtain it. But God, through his love, through his mercy, through his grace, has given us salvation. And that motive for God and his salvation to us, that got to be the motive that makes us live for him. If we are trying to live for him because we think God will be pleased by our actions or I, I want to make God happy or I want to make my parents happy and I got to do all these different things to earn God's favor, we got it wrong. Salvation is grace-driven. Sanctification should be grace-driven. We live for him because we want to, because of the grace that's been given to each one of us in our lives. So again, these things were fascinating, these individuals, because they see the grace that was going to come. And then I want you to see one last thing, because really these verses are, are filled with this phrase. And I want you to see the recipients of salvation. Specifically here in these verses, again, I'm not saying that the prophets and the Old Testament saints were not recipients of salvation. They received Christ, okay, the same way we do, which is by faith. It's always been by faith. Uh, faith is what made Abraham have righteousness. And so we see that in the Old Testament, but we can all agree that they only saw part of it. They did not see the complete salvation story. They had pictures, they had illustrations, they had things that can point them to Christ, but they were not able to see the complete salvation story of what Christ did on the cross. So I want you to notice a few words, and I underline these words in my Bible because over and over it's emphasized of who the recipients of this salvation that Peter is talking about. In verse 10, the last two words, it says, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. In verse 12, it says, Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves. Talk about the prophets. So these things were revealed to the prophets, but it wasn't revealed for the prophets, but unto us. They did minister the things which are now reported unto you. By them that preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desired to look in. The recipients of the gospel is us. 
over and over. As the prophet said, we revealed it. We saw this, but it wasn't for us. We wrote these things down for your benefits. So I think there's two things that we should consider. Number one, we should consider what we have received. Again, going back to those four perspectives, we've got the, the prophets and the angels and, and the apostles. They, they, they understood the magnitude of salvation. Do we understand the magnitude of salvation? Do we understand, can we consider for a moment exactly what it is that we have received? We have received grace. We have fully received what the prophets searched so diligently for. We have received what the Holy Spirit revealed to the prophets and apostles. We have received what the apostles faithfully proclaimed. We have received what the angels marveled at. We have received the most amazing gift in the world. We will enjoy the blessings of salvation for eternity, and we already get to enjoy the benefits of salvation in the moment. We have received hope. We have received a second chance. We have received an inheritance that will never fade away. That's us. We've received that. And Peter, when he was writing to these Christians, he said, listen, I know life right now is difficult. Life right now for you is tough. You're going through all these trials and you've been scattered about through all the regions of the earth. But can I just encourage you? Think about the salvation that you have received. The prophets wrote these things down for you. The apostles, they faithfully preached the gospel for you. This salvation is for us. And you know what? We do live in a crazy time. 2019 is a crazy time to be alive. But you know what? It's also a great privilege to be alive and see the full salvation story in God's word. We can look back and see it prophesied, but we also get to see the fulfillment in Christ Jesus. And we have the complete revelation of God's word. So not only should we consider what we have received, but I also want you to consider one more thing, and that is consider how we should respond. So what does it mean for all this? This is where I want to try to give a little bit of application if I can. What, it, what does this theme of salvation mean for us? Well, that's where Peter goes next. If you were to read the next few verses in this chapter, I think you can draw the conclusion of where Peter's going based upon what we've heard. Based upon what we received, here's how we should respond. And there's several things in there. I think, you know, one way we can respond is by loving God, which is found there in verse number eight. We can trust God. We can live in joy. Um, verse 10, we can diligently search out the scriptures. Verse 12 talks about the, the apostles faithfully shared. I think we could respond that way by faithfully telling others about what we have received. But I want you to see really just one main takeaway that's found in verse 13, if you would. In verse 13, there's that word wherefore. And so verse 13 is building upon the foundation that Peter's just laid down for us in these first 12 verses, specifically the last two or three verses. And so here in verse 13, it says, with this theme of salvation in mind, wherefore, gird up the loins of your minds, be sober, and hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There are several commands in verse 13, but the primary command is where it says, hope to the end for the grace that is going to be brought to you. The command is to hope. The other commands where it says, gird up the Lord your mind and be sober, have to do with hoping for that grace. It has the idea of, of kind of focusing your thoughts on this hope for grace. Has the idea of not being distracted by other things, but to be sober, to be clear-minded, and not putting our hope in something else. And so that clear-cut command is this, hope for the grace that is going to be brought to you. And so Peter is writing to Christians. Possibly many Christians he was writing to were on that border of losing hope. And he wanted to offer a message of hope to them. He says, don't give up. Hope in the grace that has been brought to you. Hope in Jesus Christ. And again, 2019, probably some similarities in our lives compared to the Christians that Peter was writing to. 
It's not always easy. Sometimes as a Christian, we can think about even losing hope and wondering what's going on, what's happening. You know, you know these things are going out of control. What do I do? I think the command for us tonight is, hey, there's hope. Hope in Jesus Christ. Hope to the end for the grace. Place your hope on him, not on other things. There's a verse in Psalms 146 that kind of summarizes what we just talked about, but it's from the Old Testament. It says this, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to the earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Or blessed is the man whose hope is in the Lord. And so here the psalmist says, don't put your hope in riches. Don't put your hope in things of this world. Those things, they're going to fade away. Okay, don't put your hope in someone's person. That person's going to die and, no, and breathe no longer. But put your hope in Jesus Christ, who is our living hope. And understand the grace that has been given to us. Understand the salvation that we have received. And then consider how we should respond based upon the salvation we received. I told you if you keep reading the rest of 1 Peter, Peter gives us more things that we could be doing because of God's grace in our life. He talks about being obedient. He talks about being holy. He talks about laying aside former lusts and desires. But it all begins with that focus of our mind, focusing on our hope in Jesus Christ. A few minutes ago, as we were going through our song service, our teens, they, they sang that song called Living Hope. And in just a moment, we're going to pray, and we're going to close with that, so that song this evening as a congregational song and give us a chance this evening for each one of us to respond and to praise the Lord for the hope that's been given to us. But I just want to read a few of the verses um, the, some of the lyrics here are very strong and uh, have some very good teaching in them, but it starts out by saying, How great the chasm that lay between us! How high the mountain that I could not climb! In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. And in that third verse, this beautifully portrays the gospel message and the resurrection when it says, Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. And out of silence the roaring lion declared that the grave has no claim on me. And tonight, we can have hope because our Savior is alive. He's conquered death. And he is our living hope. Would you bow your heads in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this letter that was written to these Christians who were definitely struggling and maybe even contemplating different scenarios in their life and maybe some of those scenarios included not having hope. But Peter, it was his concern for these Christians that they would have hope and that hope would be in Jesus Christ. And God, I know tonight your desire is the same for each one of us. And I want to pray specifically tonight, maybe there's somebody here this evening that has never trusted you as their personal Savior. That these blessings of salvation that we talked about and that the recipient of salvation does not apply to them because they have never received your Savior in their life. And I pray that tonight that they would be willing to talk to somebody. I pray that they would ask some questions for their own and uh, allow someone to share from God's word how they can be saved. But God, I do pray for each of our, each Christian that's here tonight. Lord, I pray that this will just be a reminder to us. This is nothing new that we probably haven't heard before. But God, I pray that this would be a reminder to each one of us that our hope would always be in you. 
and not in something else from this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand and would you sing this song with us as we close out our service this evening? Jesus Christ, my 